I had this, just a brief note, which I intended to connect with Latif. Uh, because it has to do with a person who is so central in all the narratives we've been trying to weave this this afternoon, all of today, and that's Ismail Zain. And uh, of course, Ismail's renowned uh, exegesis on Latif's fever is now part of the lexicon on Latif's, the literature on Latif. And that was relayed and talked about a little later. I just want to draw another atten uh, attention to another matter that, that Ismail was equally focused on, obsessed by. He, he was more obsessed with Latif than any other single artist that I know. He has written more on Latif than any other artist. And in all of his writings, somewhere he slips in the question of Latif's fever. But there is another in which the topic is crying, weeping. It's not Latif. It is Siti Nurbaya. Uh, an essay that, that Ismail wrote, and it has the same or comparable temperature to what he writes on Latif. Siti Nurbaya has many tellings, has many appearances. Uh -huh. As a piece of literature, it's of course a novel written by Mara Rusli, in the 1920s in, in Indonesia, and it's called in English, Siti Nurbaya, Unrealized Love. It really has to do with a young lady who undergoes tremendous travails and never quite uh, reaches a, 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 moment, a moment of happiness, a tone of happiness. And, um, Siti Nurbaya becomes almost a folkloric figure. So it's not only in literature, but also in Ismail's great proportion of oral telling, oral literature. And, and in the essay, he begins by saying, Siti Nurbaya is no more because or orality is no more. And Siti Nurbaya has been killed by the written word. But that's not, that's not the point. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the essay has this section in it, and I just want to read that to you. This is his description. It's highly erotic, and rightly so. This is how he describes Siti Nurbaya. Round, ebony eyes, a coquettish nose, Black hair unfolding like a palm blossom, a slender waist, full breasts, delightful to the eye, adept at reciting the Quran. She is a faithful, demure girl. She possesses all the qualities of the ideal housewife. She is a child of nature, free from artificial ra raising agents preservatives or coloring, permitted or otherwise. Siti Nurbaya is wholly authentic. The thiamine form, thiamine is a kind of a vitamin B, which comes from rice husk, from pounded rice bran that nourished her, not only gave her a smooth skin for the rest of her life, but the chain reaction of this, this is brilliant, Isma, enzyme also guaranteed a strong and well-functioning nervous system. Indeed, Siti Nurbaya has the extraordinary tenacity to confront the cliched, cruel mother-in-law and her husband's four wives. When her husband relates that the four episodes that caused him to take new wives, she responds placidly without protest. 
after union with him at dawn, at least according to the Malay films. If a personal secret is in danger of being revealed, her tears flow silently as she arranges the engagement offerings for her husband time and time again. Truly, whenever an issue is too heavy to handle, Siti Nurbaya reacts with tears. Carefully covered, her eyes fixed on the floor, she overhears her father say that he has promised her to someone in marriage. She traces a map upon the mat with her forefinger and her eyes well up with tears. The rationality of weeping is complex in orality. For a long time, weeping was considered an aesthetic device that could not fail to pierce the heart. Ning Fatima truly understood this potential. And he goes on. Um, about five years after this essay was written, there was that famous cinematic episode, cinematic-like episode at the Amno General Assembly here in Kuala Lumpur when Mahathir cried. And we thought how apt this would have been if we had co completed that edition of Ismail Zain's writings to talk about the aesthetics of crying on a national level. And about 18 years earlier, Lee Kuan Yew cried when Malaysia, when Singapore had to leave Malaysia. So there's a, there's a whole, there's a whole sort of school uh, of, of, of crying. Uh, that's that's one, and Ismail Ismail talks about it continuously in that essay. Um, in that unfinished project on Ismail Zain's writing, I I wrote I wrote an introduction which remains unpublished. And if you forgive me, that I will read my what I wrote. Is that all right? <laughs> because it has to do with with. Uh, and if, if Latif will forgive me, I'm going to project a slide, not by Latif, of course, but by another artist. So this is what I said then. Okay. In reading Siti Nurbaya's lament, as told by Ismail, my thoughts converge on a painting by Muhammad Hussein Inas, titled Admonition and dated 1954. This painting is with the Lambaga Nagara, the, the, the National uh, Electricity Board, I think. But Ismail knows this picture very well and has written extensively on it. But this is me writing on Ismail and this painting. I have commented on this picture in earlier paintings, noting the rhetorical tenor of its composition and drawing attention to the teardrop streaking down the right cheek of the female figure as she turns and coils herself towards the viewer. Ismail's explication of Siti Nurbaya's demeanor as exemplifying weeping as an aesthetic device, as a strategy for safeguarding the female self is illuminating. And in my opinion, it furnishes admonition with an expanded iconographic matrix. I wanted to, I didn't, I don't think it, it is inappropriate to end on this note from my point of view because Ismail and Latif uh, almost umbilically connected, if I can use that term. And um, if that's not uh, rather forbidding. And, and to talk about fever on the other hand and weeping on the other is not altogether outrageous. Thank you, Latif and Ismail.